Welcome to the Jungian Anthology Podcast, Analytical Psychology Seminar from the T.G. Jung Institute of Chicago. Episode 14, Jung and Spirituality, with Warren Sibylla, Jr., Ph.D. The slides from this talk are available online, and a link is in our show notes. And today's lecture will be introduced by Mary Doherty, Director of Programming and Past President of the T.G. Jung Institute of Chicago. Hello, my name is Mary Doherty, and I'm here to introduce Warren Sibylla, who will be speaking on the topic of Jung and spirituality. Warren's presentation was a part of the September program 2015 on getting to know Jung. In this presentation, Warren spoke about how Jung explored and conceptualized the importance of spirituality in the lives of his patients. Warren addresses the difference between evidence-based treatment as a scientific approach to treatment with an emphasis on the objective experiment in contrast to Jung's approach to treatment based on the subjective experience of the individuation journey. Warren showed slides of the ox herding pictures from the 11th century China that parallel the phases of the individuation or spiritual journey. These images certainly enhance my experience of Warren's presentation, but his comments are extremely worthwhile, even without the pictures. The pictures emphasize the irrational and the subjective experience of a spiritual practice versus the emphasis on embracing a rational and objective creed as a product. His comments also touched on how the symbol is contained within the image, as well as the importance of ritual in creating a container for spiritual experience. I'm sure you will enjoy his talk. I don't know that you'll find uh, a bigger proponent for these ideas and the application of these ideas in across multiple uh, areas than myself. Um, and I could go on for a while, but I'll just tell you, my parents cleaned out their attic <clears throat> a few years ago, and my mom happened upon my first book report uh, that I wrote in third grade, which was on a book talking about dreams. Uh, <laughs> And then she reminded me that I used to ask my siblings for their dreams at the breakfast table. So I, I've been with these ideas for a while. Um, and there'll be time, if I go too fast, there'll be time at the end uh, uh, to ask questions. So I'm very, very pleased to be here. And uh, also, uh, I have a difficult topic, uh, Jung and spirituality. Uh, Jung had 20 volumes, and I get about 40 minutes. So, and not only that, but 40 minutes for, uh, you know, just to introduce really the essence of the Jungian model, uh, the, the, real, uh, the real juice of the model. So the most that I can do is just introduce some of these topics and hopefully uh, encourage you to come back for more. First, I'm going to start out with this, uh, actually a couple stories. I'll tell, tell the story of the money tree. Uh, some of you might be familiar with the money tree, actually from uh, South America. Um, I rescued uh, a money tree from the grocery store a couple of years ago. <laughs> and uh, it started doing well. Uh, the apartment that I'm here have to week in South Bend half the week, and the apartment that I had here, lots of window space, lots of sun, it did very, very well. Uh, and so then I decided, you know, well is not well enough. It needs fertilizing. It could go faster. It could be greener. It could be bigger. Uh, my other plants need fertilizing. Uh, this one must too. So I fertilized it. Uh, and then little by little, it stopped growing. <clears throat> Not to worry, it'll catch up. My other plants are doing well. Uh, just be patient. Then, uh, one by one, uh, 
the leaves started yellowing and they fell off. It's kind of like that Christmas tree and the peanuts, you know, where there's all the leaves fall off. Um, but then uh, I waited uh, and it got late one night and the last leaf fell off just before midnight. Now that's important. Uh, really studying very carefully the whole experience. Uh, I got very sad. Then I decided, well, you know, there is something that I could do. So I took it out, I washed it <clears throat> in my sink, washed all the roots, got a new pot of soil, and potted it, repotted it. Uh, this is the money tree today. <laughs> I've had to twice move it because it's trying to push through the ceiling. <laughs> and it's heliotropic, it moves toward the sun. Uh, and so if I continually twist it, <laughs> I won't have to move for a while. Uh, it's very difficult to move from apartment to apartment. I probably should cut it, but I don't want to touch it. Um, and I think that this serves as a wonderful example for uh, the inherent order of the psyche, namely Jung's idea of the self, that the self is the grand paradox. It is the journey and the destination in one. He actually gets that idea, uh, it, it says so, uh, from the East. The journey and the destination, which is to say the infant is no less whole on the first day as on the last day. Each and every day unfolds. <clears throat> okay, my stories are about flowers now. My kids are older uh, and independent, and so now I've taken out flowers <laughs> and plants and trees. Uh, and in particular, the uh, African violet. Uh, I went to a African violet flower show uh, up at the Botanical Garden a couple of years ago. And it was really an incredible experience because uh, you get to see the, you know, the, the whole of humanity. <laughs> uh, has anybody been to a flower show? Yeah. They're kind of competitive. I thought it was going to be a fun Sunday. <laughs> These guys are competitive. I mean, you know, how purple is purple? <laughs> and and they, would, they would have boxes where they would have their flowers, and they would, just at the right moment, they would present their flower to the judge, and they, uh, it's really something. So then I started asking questions and realized that the people that didn't win then become judges next year. <laughs> and it just rotates until their flower gets to win. <laughs> so, uh, but quickly, I sided with the flowers. You know, uh, how purple is purple? Or do I, am I purple enough? Right? Which is, <clears throat> which is to say, uh, we live in a world that has become obsessed with the objective. Our discipline uh, is being, my perspective, <clears throat> is being infected uh, by the obsession with the objective. Uh, for example, you know, evidence-based treatment. Uh, also, uh, I teach at the Chicago School of Professional Psychology, and they are using uh, a treatment manual to uh, teach psychotherapy to would-be psychologists. A treatment manual. Now, the would-be psychologists, many of them really like this, because it's, it grossly simplifies uh, what otherwise is quite complex, namely us. And they can then say, well look, I did what it said on 
page 12. I did what it said. It didn't, you know. So therefore, you're the problem. <laughs> Not the manual. Right? Jung's motto, and in particular spirituality, is a relationship with the subjective. Okay? Now, now here, look at this. <clears throat> the hallmark of objectivity, science, right, is the experiment. We reach out into nature, take a piece of it, look at it, say something about it, recognizing a 5% error rate, we might be wrong a bit, then we put it back, right? <clears throat> the hallmark uh, on the other side, the subjective, would be experience, right? Simply one's experience, my experience with my money tree or the flower show, my experience. The interesting thing is that experience and experiment are essentially the same word. They have the same etymology, which means to learn by way of repeated trials. The question becomes, do we trust this outer objective world or do we trust the inner subjective world? Right? Now, I've, I've posed that in terms of a dichotomy. Jung's model is a relationship between the two, but not one in spite of the other. Right? What, what he early on called number one and number two personality. Right? The objective, this outer world, and the inner world are subjective experience. In fact, when you study very carefully, uh, radically study, one's subjectivity, you arrive at the objectivity, namely the archetypes, the universal patterning of our experiences. <clears throat> One very quick example. Uh, two small girls that I've been seeing now for a couple of years <clears throat> uh, whose parents are going through a divorce, uh, they are uh, making, drawing pictures for me in their therapy. What's very interesting, independent of one another, they each, I see them separately, although back to back, each of them has the full range of my uh, art supplies. <clears throat> each of them uh, draws their parents using the exact same colors. That's the archetype. So even in one's radical subjectivity, there is a pattern. One doesn't have, in other words, it doesn't have to be objective at the expense of subjective. <clears throat> okay, now, I think one of the ways, one of perhaps the easiest way, especially with the limited time that we have, uh, to talk about this topic is to look at how it's been represented graphically. Uh, one of which would be the absurding pictures from Zen Buddhism in a particular uh, 11th century uh, China. Uh, there are a series of, uh, actually there are four series. There's a series of uh, five, six, eight, and then the current set is at 10. I won't go into the history more than that, but they, they represent the spiritual journey. Okay, one way of graphically trying to represent some of these ideas. Now, uh, this is the first picture <clears throat> and these pictures are painted using the uh, philosophical principle of Wabi, W-A-B-I, uh, which is uh, akin to uh, Jung's notion of uh, individuation. Namely, that the picture as you see it is perfect, whole, and complete, lacking nothing. It is exactly as it's meant to be. Nothing is superfluous. Nothing is added, nothing is exaggerated, nothing is minimized. It is exactly as it's intended to be. Okay, that's very important. <coughs> and uh, for this final set, there is a walk, what's called a waka, W-A-K-A, -A, which is uh, a teaching poem. <coughs> and for this one, the first card, says, vigorously cutting a path through the brambles, you search for the ox. 
the ox is a metaphor for the self, the spiritual journey. Wide rivers, eternal mountains, the path seems endless. With strength depleted and mind exhausted, he cannot find it. There's only the gentle rustle of maple leaves and the cicada's evening song. Okay, now, <clears throat> a, few things, uh, a few things to point out here. Yeah, we'll use this uh, the pointer here. A um, few things to point out here. First of all, recognize that the ox herder is uh, amidst the forest. also is on a bridge. The ox herder is betwixt and between, in the middle, uh, known in blues music as being at the crossroads. Neither here nor there. <clears throat> in a cross-cultural parallel, uh, this would be the place of the altar in a cruciform-shaped uh, church. Square in the middle, neither north, south, east, or west, without direction. <clears throat> Notice also that the ox herder is looking over his her shoulder. In psychoanalytic thought, depression is a consequence of what has not happened, but was supposed to have happened. It's rear view mirror living, right? And more specifically, in Jung's model, um, it has a creative potential. It needs to be unpacked. <coughs> so the observer is looking over his or her shoulder. They're looking backward. They're reflecting. They're not out in the metric in the world that's counting right, wrong, should, shouldn't, purple, red, high enough, low enough, fast enough, not fast enough. <clears throat> the symbol for Jung carries the energy. Latin symbolum, which means thrown together, the opposites thrown together. Okay. Regarding the symbol, Jung says, their pregnant language cries out to us that they mean more than they say. A symbol remains a perpetual challenge to our thoughts and feelings. That probably explains why a symbolic work is so stimulating, why it grips us so intensely, but also why it seldom affords us a purely aesthetic enjoyment. So at best, a symbol seduces us, leads us, takes us into areas we wouldn't otherwise go. At worst, it torments us uh, with what we don't know, but could know. The image is contained within the symbol, the, the symbol is contained within the image. <coughs> the image is the container. This is from uh, the set from Pu Ming, uh, the set of six pictures. Also the first picture, but they, that's what was changed. They added some on each end. Jung says regarding the image, the image is always an expression of the totality perceived and perceivable, apprehended and apprehensible by the individual. It's a container of all opposites. for this first picture says a raging ox with menacing horns runs away across hills and streams where black clouds shroud the valley who knows what sprouts lie crushed right and I think the last 
last line there is particularly important. It ties in with both uh, what both of my colleagues said. Without consciousness, we run roughshod, <clears throat> unknowingly. As Goethe said, there's nothing more frightening than active ignorance. You see this also in the political races. <laughs> I mean, this really, this season, I look forward to this once every four years when I teach because I, I, I have all the examples I need right, right, right at hand. <clears throat> Why is that? Because when we get into groups, the projections start really flying very, very quickly. And that's one reason why Dean was very, very leery of groups. Uh, we get a, a group mentality, crystallization, is what the social psychologists would call it. Um, we would call it simply loss of, of ego, loss of individual voice. <clears throat> said, <clears throat> with strength depleted and mind exhausted, you cannot find it. Right? Perfect, whole, and complete, lacking nothing. The image has all that is necessary. With strength depleted and mind exhausted, you cannot find it. Yes, you cannot. <clears throat> That's the spiritual journey. It's not up to you alone. There has to be some type of transformation, some type of death to the ego. Okay. Now, uh, in extreme forms, say extreme depression with suicide, that change becomes concretized, literalized. Right? It can't be lived experientially, subjectively, however difficult, it becomes literalized, right? One way or another, there has to be a change. That is the pattern of growth. There has to be a death to the ego. In Zen, they would uh, call this the backward step, the great death, the backward step, looking within, finding the compass within instead of orienting oneself from without outside oneself. That is to say, to live within the subjectivity of yourself. Now, Jung's argument, uh, very simply uh, summarized, was that the churches were treating uh, this subjective experience as a static entity, <clears throat> putting it in the form of a creed, which makes it about belief instead of experience. That they're, they're making a product instead of a moment. Right? Um, I'll tell you a story. Uh, our local parish Catholic parish <clears throat> so several years ago. This was really bothersome to me. But I, I've studied the architecture, uh, sacred architecture for many years, and realized that in our local parish, <clears throat> as with the Gothic cathedrals, the windows were typological, which in architectural language means one side tells the beginning of the story and the other side tells the other. They, they, one makes a promise and the other side answers it which makes it a living experience, right? Not a static entity, but a living experience. And I tried one Sunday <clears throat> after mass to explain this, th to ask the, the pastor about this, and he had no idea what I was talking about. <laughs> I thought, okay, well, sorry, it's not his thing. So I was explaining it to him, and I could get worked up pretty quickly. And he said to me very nicely, put his hand on my shoulder and said very nice to me, he said, you know, I understand what you're saying, and I see that it's really important to you. My job is about uh, filling the collection basket and <laughs> filling the pews, and I, I really have my hands full with that. 
So I, I get what you're saying. It means, you know, I see it means a lot to you, but uh, that was about it for me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> if, if that's if that's prototypic, unfortunately, I know that's a stereotype, but that was that, that's prototypic. It's a product that's being bought and sold at the expense of the experience. For Jung, it's the experience and studying very, very carefully the experience. Um, because without that study, the symbols will run roughshod over us. I, I mean, there are, uh, obviously there are certain religious symbols um, that if treated in a particular way will stir people up very, very quickly. You, you can't convince me that they're not loaded with energy loaded with history, history that is loaded with experience in relating to these very powerful images filled with symbols. <coughs> cutting a path through the brambles, you search for the ox. The brambles uh, are the, the thorny vine-like uh, structures, right? I mean, some states even use them as a kind of guardrail. I mean, that, that's how thick they are. Right? We get through our complexes. We have a better relationship with our complexes. We've got to try to get through these brambles, these stop points. Wide rivers, eternal mountains, the path seems endless. That's exactly where they need to be. Right? Without opinion. Betwixt and between. So that once strength is depleted, mind exhausted, there must be something outside myself. I don't have the answer any longer. Only the gentle rustle of maple leaves and the cicada's evening song. Now here's the clue. Cicada's evening song. We're told if this isn't here, this isn't here, this isn't here. What is here is the rustle of maple leaves and the cicada's evening song. Now, the cicada is akin to the butterfly. Right? Now, the etymology etymology of all these words. Um, the etymology of our discipline, psyche, is butterfly. Right? That precedes soul from the Greek. And what we know about the butterfly is that it begins with the larva. Right? Not particularly attractive. Gravity bound. And also prone to danger easily could be taken out. <clears throat> then something happens. Right? That's the important piece. Something happens, not of its doing. A process unfolds, and it cocoons. Uh, still, that cocoon is at, uh, in danger. Right? Something takes place within the cocoon, and then suddenly it's released. Right? Again, a process. And then it's no longer gravity bound. Right? Uh, very similar uh, to the cicada. So what we're told here is the natural rhythms of nature need to take place. Otherwise, you're not going to find your way out of this. Otherwise, it will be up to you, small y, instead of you in relationship to the self, capital S. Okay, now, with that in mind,
notice that the oxer has the reins in her left hand. <clears throat> she has the means at hand to relate to the ox. But she doesn't see it. <clears throat> also, uh, in a similar manner, the ox herder is looking over her left shoulder. Left, not right. Left, the irrational. The subjective, not the objective. Objective would be right. Right? Um, as an example, our uh, faucets, the left faucet is hot. The devil. The right side is cold. Left side is the sinister. That which we don't know. That which is less socialized. We don't so, uh, shake hands with our left hands. We shake hands with our right hands. <clears throat> so the answer is looking over her left shoulder. Yes, exactly. Into the subjective. then a means of how do we tie it together? <clears throat> the objective, the subjective, experience, symbol, image. And here I will introduce Jung's idea of ritual. Ritual is creating a container for the experience of the sacred. Creating a container, not created, it's a verb. It's continually creating, recognizing the divine, the spiritual, and participating in it, ritual, and participating in it. <coughs> Seeing one's self as reflected in that whole, the experience of individuation. Spiritual practice then, the concentrated effort toward embracing the whole of our human experience. Saying yes to all that it means to be human. Linking it with my colleagues, it's Jung saying that it's this consciousness that will dictate our future. This consciousness. This container of the divine that will dictate our future. Not somewhere else. Notice this, this is card eight, the Enso. And notice on this, uh, with this card, there's no first and last. <clears throat> there's no male and female. There's no objective and subjective. There's no dichotomy. Every point is equal to another. That's not to say that each point is the same. They're not. But no point is better than another. Each point is exactly as it's intended to be, when it's intended to be that. Okay, thank you very much for your time and attention. Okay. Please. happening in the moment. <clears throat> you know, I, I often use the, the example of if you're living your life using only the rear view mirror, you can only crash. That, that's the only thing that can happen. There has to be a combination. You have to see out the window. You don't drive without the rear view mirror, 
but it has to be in combination with the, the windshield. The past does inform the future, but it can't be, the future can't be at the, you know, at the exclusion of the past, right? Um, we say in psychology, uh, you know, where psychologists are asked repeatedly uh, to do risk assessments. I have to do a risk assessment of a sophomore on Monday morning before they will let him back to school. Uh, impossible. How do we predict behavior? Well, we say the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. You want to know what somebody's going to do, look to what they've done. Problem is, that's a linear model. And if you follow that out, that means behavior never changes. <laughs> well, that doesn't happen. So what's the, what's the antidote? What's the complement? The complement is the best predictor of future behavior is your intention. Well, we don't like that because that, we can't hold that. Right? We can't, that's, we can't objectify that. The school wants something objective. Tell us he'll never do this. Well, that means he wouldn't have a heartbeat. Uh, I, I can't do that. Well, reasonable certainty. It's Monday morning. How about that? <laughs> That's reasonable certainty. Uh, so it, it's always a combination, but but it's changing the ratio. So the, the, the complement would be to look in the present moment. What's what's not happening in the present? What are you not seeing in the present moment? What is being overlaid too much from the past, which is occluding a more comprehensive look at the present. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Does it definitely include what we don't see? Like the, 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 the mental state? Well, it's... it's the I, I'm looking for a tool I can use to stop the lifelong habit of living in the rear view mirror. You can... Uh, in any given moment, you can uh, uh, look at 10 uh, items and uh, become aware of them. This moment, this temperature, this feeling, this color, this... Uh, 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 then, I say it's, it's complex because there may be something still that needs to unfold from the past. You was very clear to say, uh, you don't just rush in and open everything up and like Christmas morning, things have to unfold over a period of time. So there, there may be things that still need to unfold. The, the, Jung's whole model is a, 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 a tension of opposite. So it's, it, one can't be at the expense of the other. So one complement to that would be um, I'm here, I'm awake, this is soft, this feels warm, this is green, this is hard, this is lunch, this is, and that brings you back into that moment. Thank you, mm -hmm. very helpful. Mm -hmm. Please, Mary. Talk about intuition. Yes. Jung's working definition of intuition, well, first of all, he said it was the sticky wicket. Right? Or, it's the sticky wicket of the four um, because it is intuition by way of the unconscious. Perception, sorry, by way of the unconscious. Which is to say, uh, people who are intuitive um, perceive things uh, quicker faster and often more comprehensive than those around them because they're, they're taking in a different data set. Um, not necessarily always so pleasant. 
I'll give an example. Uh, a year and a half ago, some of you may remember there was that um, drowning uh, in the river. Uh, when it was frozen over, somebody had lost their cell phone from Minnesota. <coughs> and they all just walk into the ice and get it, and then suddenly several of them were on and went around. Um, well, my apartment at that time was right across the way, and I was sleeping, and pink into the middle of the dream was, get up, something's happening really important now in the river. <laughs> but, okay, got up, looked out the window, shh, everything was happening. That's perception by way of the unconscious. You know, there, there's, there's data there, um, we just tend not to take it in. Uh, and it requires a great deal of trust because it's irrational. It was one of the two irrational functions, meaning ratio that which can be you know, organized quickly, neatly, irrational that which can't be ratioed. Uh, another time, my wife was planning a surprise birthday party and I almost caught her, almost. <laughs> Just a few more hours and I would have been there. Because uh, I was asking too many questions. Like, you know, something's not right or something's not right. Something's not right. She finally just said, you know, would you stop asking so many questions? Uh, it's, it's taking in data that is usually not considered um, and honoring that and seeing that there is a validity to that. Often it requires a lot more patience uh, because it has to unfold over time. That makes sense? Yeah. Great. Following up on that, sir, uh, would you classify that as data, as data that cannot be quantified or measured to produce outcomes? Uh, well, I don't know. I, maybe I see that a bit differently because the mind's always going to take it in and try to hold on to it. So. I would, I would answer that by saying, does it always, by asking another question, does it always have to be? No, it doesn't have to be. Um, you know, uh, William Blake said, uh, truth cannot be told so as not to be understood and be believed. You know, truth is truth, it's always truth, it's never not true. Um, two people can sit silently and know and experience a truthfulness, that doesn't have to be quantified. Uh, so, no. But the mind's tendency is to quantify it. What you're saying is that this is given the data. Yes. It should not be discounted because it can't be measured. That's right. Or easily measured. Right. I'm going to add to the Please. plan. Um, because in order for it to be more purposeful, you would have attributed the extent to a trust. Yes. And it forgave you. It forgave me. You should have. I did. I made it mine and not it. That was a pronoun. The money tree. Then you were in tuition program, didn't you? That it's not wrong to interfere with the process. Mm -hmm. It's just to get to interfere in the right way. Yes, cooperate. it is where it's at now. I've had other plants uh, die, and I've tried this and that, and they didn't, and I've had to come to terms with that. Is this a good example of chance? Uh, it, it's an example of my giving the money tree its fullest opportunity to be what it was meant to be. As Jung says, the oak becomes uh, the, the oak tree and not the donkey. to get out of the way. He, he's, a, he's looking for an outsider. Mm -hmm. He's not saying that the ox 
is the cicada. That's right. But more importantly, he is the cicada. And then beyond that, um, he's not the cicada. We all are the cicada. And he is he's at best one thread in the whole tapestry. My intellect doesn't go that far. <laughs> This podcast is distributed under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. Share it all you like as long as you maintain the attribution to the speaker, but please do not change it or sell it. If you like this episode, tell your friends about us or leave us a review on iTunes. For more information about classes, training programs, videos, audio, this podcast, or to find a Jungian analyst near you, visit our website, www.jungchicago.org. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.